The adoption of new technologies undoubtedly offers us significant benefits. They can vastly improve people's everyday lives, making once difficult tasks seem easy, allowing us to communicate effortlessly, and enabling us to operate more efficiently. <clears throat> Nevertheless, as we deploy these technologies and admire their potential, we must acknowledge that if left unchecked, they can have negative repercussions. In today's connected world, people produce massive amounts of data while going about their everyday lives and when accessing government services. This data is fundamental to our city's operation. To make use of this data and to make decisions, many agencies deploy advanced data analytics and algorithms. Increasingly, algorithmic tools are deployed throughout city agencies to evaluate communities and individuals and to make determinations about services and penalties. While it is undeniable that these tools help city agencies operate more effectively and do offer residents more targeted, impactful services, algorithms are not without issue. These tools seem to offer objectivity but we must be cognizant of the fact that algorithms are simply a way of encoding assumptions, that their design can be biased, and that the very data they possess can be flawed. Over the last year, the number of studies have detailed situations in which algorithms produced biased outcomes, and I expect we will hear about a few of these cases during today's hearing. Now, despite their importance to government operations and their potential problems, algorithms remain hidden from the public view. In our city, it is not always clear when and why agencies deploy algorithms. And when they do, it is often unclear what assumptions they are based upon and what data they even consider. This partially results from algorithms' natural complexity but it is compounded by a lack of transparency. I've heard of several occasions on which members of the public requested access to the internal workings of algorithms only to be denied. A major issue is that algorithmic tools are often developed by private companies and these companies are unwilling to disclose their methods. I strongly believe the public has a right to know when decisions are made using algorithms and they have a right to know how these decisions are made. For instance, when the Department of Education uses an algorithm to assign children to different high schools and a child is assigned to their sixth choice, they and their family have a right to know how, how that algorithm determined that their child would get their sixth choice. They should not merely be told that they were assigned to a school because an algorithm made the most efficient allocation of school seats. What is considered to be most efficient? Who decided this? A mathematician? A computer programmer? Additionally, when algorithms factor into the allocation of city resources, it can be more difficult for members of the city council to advocate for their constituents and to do the oversight that we are mandated to do over this, uh, uh, as per the city charter. One of our main responsibilities is to conduct oversight of city agencies and make sure that people get these services. When there appears to be inequities or shortage of services, it is our job to find out why and work to remedy the issue. But if an allocation is determined by an algorithm, we may be unable to contest the outcome. For example, throughout my career in public service, I've attempted to learn why the police precincts I represent have not gotten additional police manpower. I've always felt that the number of police officers in my two police precincts has been disproportionately low, inadequate. To this day, no one has fully told me what is the formula that the police department uses to determine police manpower? I don't know what it is. I don't know how it works. I don't know what factors go into it. As city agencies utilize more and more advanced analytics, they must simultaneously work to make these tools transparent and available to the public and their representatives. 
We have a right to know what goes into the decisions made by city government and how they arrived at the conclusion they arrived at. It's called transparency. Now, these agencies must do so because the ability to evaluate government decision making and the ability to hold government accountable are key features of our democracy. When government institutions utilize obscure algorithms, our principles of democratic accountability are undermined. As we advance into the 21st century, we must ensure our government is not black boxed. And I have proposed this legislation not to prevent city agencies from taking advantage of cutting-edge tools, but to ensure that when they do, they remain accountable to the public. There are a, a diverse number of opinions on the best way to ensure algorithmic accountability, and after introducing this legislation, my office received met much public feedback. This input will be key to our efforts going forward, and I'm eager to hear from all the advocates today. To my knowledge, we are the first city and the first legislative body in our country to take on this issue. And as with so many other things, I'm hoping that New York City will set the example for others around the world. We've been known to take the lead, and here I think we are taking the lead throughout the country and throughout the world. This proposal is a priority for me and for this committee. I'm looking forward to working with the administration and advocates to perfect it. We have quite a lot to get done today, so without further ado, I want to welcome the administration. We're going to be hearing from Don Sunderland, Deputy Commissioner for Enterprise and Solution Architecture at the Department of Information Technology and, Communica and Telecommunications. And you are joined by, do you want to, would you identify yourself, please? Uh, Craig Campbell, Mayor's Office of Data Analytics. Greg Campbell, Mayor's Office of, Dan of Data Craig. Analytics. Craig. Greg. Craig. Okay, Craig. Greg. Okay. I have to swear you in, please. Uh, I'd like to ask everyone, please, to turn off their cell phones or put them on vibrate so that we can <clears throat> conduct the hearing uh, without interruption. This is, the largest, this is the largest attendance a technology committee meeting has ever had. I'm not oh. used to this. How do, I top this. how do I top this next month? I don't know what to do. This is great. Okay, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Okay. Mr. Sunderland, do you want to lead off? Sure. Good afternoon, Chair Vaca, and members of the Committee on Technology. My name is Don Sunderland, and I'm Deputy Commissioner for Enterprise and Solution Architecture at the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, also known as DOIT. Joining me is Craig Campbell, Special Advisor to the Mayor's Office on Data and Analytics, known as MODA. I'm here to discuss Chair Vaca's legislation, Introduction 1696, a bill that would require agencies to publish the source code of algorithms they use and allow users to test these algorithms. This is a very timely discussion, and I thank the Chair and this committee for initiating it. City agencies rely on computer programs to varying degrees to assist in targeting and delivering services to their clients, and I'm happy to talk about the broad technical processes that guide the City's use of algorithms. First, I'd like to provide some background to the committee on the work my division does at DOIT. The, the Enterprise and Solution Architecture Division comprises a team of technical architects who help do it and its sister agencies identify technology solutions to address their business needs. A relevant example of this is the recently launched Notify NYC app, which we assisted NYC Emergency Management in developing. Do its in-source team, a group that assists agencies in managing special technical projects, was dispatched to work with NYSEM in this app starting last year. This team includes several positions that agencies may not hire on their own uh, uh, f such as, um, for such as specialized projects, such as uh, technical lead, Android and iOS developers, and UX, uh, UI designer, and more. While our services are available to all city agencies, this does not afford us a comprehensive view of technology across the city. Many agencies have substantial technology shops of their own and require no assistance from us at all. 
Others only need us to help them in the design or delivery of specific features required by the total application architecture. But in all cases, we strive to deliver whatever services the agency needs to achieve its technology goal. This work provides us with broad exposure to a variety of systems implemented by various agencies, but agencies rely on their own subject matter experts to devise strategies based on goals they wish to achieve. No matter the level of the engagement, DOIT develops technical solutions to fulfill policy goals and support business processes determined by agencies. In other words, by and large, we aren't making agency rules, decisions, and, or policy. We are providing the technology that helps agencies bring those elements into the world and onto our streets. This bill seeks to increase transparency in government decision-making processes, which is a laudable goal. We understand the impetus for this legislation and believe that this bill is an excellent way to start the conversation. The Chair has been a great partner in our transparency efforts over the last few years, and we're engaged to work with the, uh, we're eager to work with the committee to achieve some of the goals of this legislation in ways that will be useful to the New Yorkers. That being said, 1696 is, in its current form, presents significant operational concerns that we must address directly. First and foremost, there are considerable security concerns. It is the opinion of our cybersecurity experts that publishing algorithms would generate considerable risk, providing a roadmap for bad actors to attack crucial city systems. Those looking to cause damage could use knowledge of these algorithms to circumvent important criteria put in place to prevent abuse of these processes. There is also meaningful risk to the private information of New Yorkers, since providing public access to decisions regarding individual benefits or services could provide tools for third parties to infer specific personal information, such as economic or disability status of persons receiving those benefits. <clears throat> Second, the scope is all-encompassing. An algorithm is a set of unambiguous instructions. All software prize, uh, programs use sets of unambiguous in instructions to carry out their functions. In targeting all algorithms involved in rendering decisions regarding service delivery or evaluative processes, the legislation potentially targets every computer program in the city, which, as you could imagine, would be an incredibly large undertaking. Almost every program supports agency operations by producing data or interim values used to support the decision-making process of the agency by humans or through algorithms and automation. As a result, under this legislation, city agencies would be required to divulge the inner workings of all their software. Aside from the sheer scope of this effort, the city's ability to do so would face innumerable legal and practical constraints, such as the use of software or vendors, proprietary code, or the inability to accurately identify the valid source code of many older systems. Third, testing is not possible. Setting aside the scope of the issue for the moment, in most cases, the ability to create public access to test the accuracy of the decisions being rendered would be nearly impossible. Decisions carried out by systems are driven by highly complex states of data and other factors that could not be uh, emulated for the purpose of public testing. Moreover, none of the relevant programs were written to be freestanding, publicly usable software. Do it in IT departments across the city would likely have to put an ex extraordinary amount of time and energy just to create a new body of software that could safely imitate the existing functionality. Fourth, this bill comes with unintended consequences. The clear and laudable intent of the legislation is to provide transparency around the city's decision making processes and service delivery. But as written, this legislation would deliver a deluge of information, the bulk of it likely unrelated to the services or decisions in which the city's constituents are most interested, thus complicating the search for very information it hopes to expose. Also, providing self-service decision testing could empower users to fabricate uh, answers that will get them the response they want. But most importantly, computers do not unilaterally make decisions. Even if it were possible to make this information available, the code is such a small part of the decision making. Often algorithms take multiple sources of data and produce results that are contingent on many other contextual factors, including policy decisions made by city employees and often shaped by local, state, and federal law. On the whole, algorithms supplement rather than replace the decision making process made by city agencies. I would like to share areas in which the city has proactively made strides in making certain kinds of algorithms transparent. 
The Mayor's Office of Data Analytics recently unveiled an analytics project library, a platform that, in addition to sharing the results of MOTA's analyses, also makes transparent the source code for these data analytics projects. When MOTA's data scientists partner with city agencies on advanced data analytics projects, they are almost always using open data exclusively. So in these instances, publishing the intermediate steps of the, of the analytics process would allow the public to apply the same um, process elsewhere. Craig Campbell from MOTA is here today to answer questions you may have about this project. Finally, an example taken from this uh, project library can further explain the administration's position on this legislation. Following the 2015 outbreak of Legionnaires disease in the Bronx, MOTA worked with several agencies to identify and track all cooling towers in New York City. The results, in addition to the data sources and methods uh, used to conduct the analysis, are available in the project library. However, the decision-making process in enacting policy to proactively prevent sources <clears throat> of Legionnaires in the future could not be uni uh, unilaterally made based solely on these analyses. We've had great successes in working with this committee to enact meaningful legislation that has, um, had, uh, has made impactful changes in this administration's transparency efforts. Thus, we'd like to hear more from the committee on the types of city decisions uh, there is interest in making more transparent. And we can subsequently work with our partner agencies to formulate a focused effort to elucidate the decision-making process in those specific areas. This concludes my prepared testimony. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I'm happy to continue the discussion with the committee. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you have testimony, Greg, or? I do not. Want to jump in when we have questions? Greg. Greg. <clears throat> Okay, I thank you for your testimony. Uh, I first want to say that I'm happy to note that the uh, open data report that MOTA now has it up, and uh, I thank you for that. Now, does that project library include all the work MOTA has done, or only a selection of the work? The project library currently includes three recent projects. Uh, we intend to do the backlog, backlog of projects prior to that uh, in the coming months. Well, your motivation to create the project library is very much closely aligned with my legislation. So you're acknowledging that it's important for data analytics to be used by city agencies in a transparent way. Correct. Okay. So am I to, am I to um, surmise by that that many of your objections, although serious, may, may not speak to the fact that you support the intent of my legislation. The Mayor's Office of Data Analytics serves as a center of excellence for the use of municipal analytics. Uh, we work with different city agencies on specific projects, uh, and we also work on certain projects as an advisor to those city agencies. We believe that our uh, open source analytics process and vision uh, closely aligns with the goals of uh, our business ownership of the open data program, uh, but we do not necessarily um, uh, our scope is not entirely citywide, uh, but we believe by serving as that center of excellence, we uh, lead in ways that uh, other people that we work with may aspire. That's a political answer. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me try to... Do you believe that the public has a right to know more about algorithms. Do you believe that my legislation addresses a transparency issue that needs to be addressed? Yes, I, I think we agree with the intent of transparency around the overall decision-making process and the degree to which algorithms contribute to that. We in this council have enacted much legislation about transparency. I'm here 12 years. Mm -hmm. Much of our legislation has been about transparency. Mm -hmm. Yet, much of it is behind, much of what decisions are, much about how decisions are arrived at is cloaked. 
and it's not fully known to us, yes. and it's not fully explained to us. And data goes into the algorithm that determines what many agencies do, and that's what we don't have. Mm -hmm. Now, you indicated that you work with many agencies on a regular basis in the city. How and why does Moda decide to work with a particular agency? Are you working with every single agency, or how do you decide what agency to work with? So Moda in particular is uh, a small but mighty group. We work on administrative priorities, uh, such as universal pre-K or IDNYC, uh, specific data analytics projects for those programs. Um, we work on cross-agency projects. An example of that is the uh, Tenant Harassment Prevention Task Force. Uh, and then we work on high value projects that come from agency solicitation. So different agencies will approach us uh, for our services and we'll partner with them. So what I just heard from you is that you seem to work on agency projects that are determined to be a priority of the mayor or where there is a legislative mandate for you to act. That's correct. Okay. That leaves out a whole bunch of agencies. Mm -hmm. Does Moda create any data analytics tools that agencies then continue to use on their own? Yes, our goal is uh, not to own any analytics projects long term, uh, but to develop capacity and hand them off. So you help agencies determine their own data analytics criteria and usage policies? For very specific projects, but not universally or unilaterally, but on the specific do projects. You then, do you then have input into what information these agencies can give to the public when it comes to how they arrived at basic decisions? So as part of the uh, project library, we're not only disclosing uh, the source code behind the analytics and the algorithms that we're developing, but also information in a plain language form on uh, the uh, technology landscape and the policy goals that were made uh, as part of that engagement. But again, that represents um, you know, a limited number of, of projects that, that our office is involved in. All right. I have a lot of questions. Let me ask you something. The RAND formula, R-A-N-D, the RAND formula, what is it? What was the question? I'm sorry. What's the RAND formula, R-A-N-D, RAND? Oh, it's, 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 uh, to my understanding, it's a formula that's used by the fire department. Yes. What is it, though? What, is, what goes into the RAND formula? I, I can't tell you. I'm, I, I, I'm not a subject matter expert on that. This formula has been in existence for 20 years. I am a former district manager to a community board. I am a councilman 12 years. I cannot tell you what the RAND formula is. Yet I know it determines fire protection services. Mm -hmm. I know it also had a, um, a role in determining police manpower numbers. But it was never told to anyone that I know of. And officials in the fire department in the past have stated that they know what it is, but the public does not have a right to know. I don't accept that. I want to know what governs how many offices I have and the level of fire protection I have. Why am I not allowed to know that? What goes into that formula, data, algorithm? Mm -hmm. This is the basis for my, for my legislation. Here we have a formula in use for 20 years, and you're from Do It, representing them in a very able, able way but you don't know what it is. Do you know anyone in the fire department who knows what the formula is? I mean, we, don't, we don't have subject matter expertise in that area. We generally... But, but you said you consult with other city agencies. Don't you know something as basic as the RAND formula? Do you consult with the fire department? We were not consulted um, in the development of that formula or the development of the system that delivers it. Has it been updated in 20 years? I have, I, I'm sorry, I don't know. You don't know. The big secret. I wonder how many people in the fire department knows what the, know what the RAND formula is. Do you have a list of which agencies have their own data analytics and software development items? Which agencies or, or teams? 
We don't have a comprehensive list of who would be doing their own data analytics. I mean, we run across them on kind of an episodic basis, but we've, you know, uh, we don't have an ability to, to comprise an, a comprehensive list of where an, uh, data analysis is being done. But if the mayor has an office of data analytics, why doesn't he know what agencies are using data analytics? Well, <clears throat> the office of data analytics was put together actually as a, as a, um, a functional team to execute on specific analytical goals, not as a, um, a, a, a comprehensive citywide, you know, um, inventory of where all analytics are. The idea was to be able to augment the analytical capabilities, not necessarily supplant them throughout all the agencies across the city. So is there no real centralized oversight over which, over when agencies deploy potentially complex data analytics? Yeah, there, there is not, and I would, uh, I would argue that it's probably better that way. In general, if we take a look, for instance, at the, at the group that I had, which is the Enterprise and Solutions Architecture Group. Enterprise architecture implies a comprehensive technology architecture, but you can't actually prescribe it in a, a, a comprehensive technology ar architecture if you don't understand every problem the city is trying to serve. So the, the city has been organized with the idea of putting the technology as closely as possible to the actual operational functionality that the agencies have to deliver. This is the best, best model for delivering the most um, um, efficient and, and best focused technology. And in many instances, you know, the analytics associated with that technology would be part of that development effort. You realize these are administrative issues. It, at, what, at what level is there an understanding of these issues in the city? You, your agency doesn't seem to know what other agencies are doing when it comes to data analytics and we don't, algorithms. That's, <clears throat> that's actually not our function as an agency, is to understand what every agency does. Our, our, our function as, a, as a, a central IT agency is to provide services to those agencies to implement their designs, not to dictate the designs to them. Has any, has any agency ever come to you and said that they want to provide more transparency because of the algorithms that are used and asked you for assistance in providing greater transparency? I've never been approached with that question. No. Okay. Can you explain the process that occurs when agencies procure data analytics tools from third-party vendors? Um, I, you know, beyond what the normal... Um, procurement rules for the city are, I couldn't, I couldn't provide you any further insight on that. I mean, it, it would be a case-by-case, application-by-application, use-by-use basis. Well, when you do contract out for data analyst tools, do you provide private companies with any sensitive or proprietary data by which they train their products? That's, that's something you would have to take up on a case-by-case -case basis with the agencies themselves as to what data is required for them to train up tools like that. Now, do you know of any city agencies that make use of information provided by private data brokers? I don't uh, firsthand have any knowledge of those, no. Now, one objection you raised to my legislation is that releasing the source code for particular decisions could have negative security implications. I do understand this concern but I have also heard some experts assert that open source software can have more robust security. Could you explain the difference in thought here? Well, the, the, um, the technology that's been developed over the last 20 years doesn't have the benefit of what, a, of what a, an open source library might have in many instances, which is complete transparency to begin with. I mean, open source by its definition is public. So um, a lot of the stuff that makes it into an open source stack ends up being very well vetted and thoroughly understood and doesn't divulge anything critical about the actual internal workings of the, uh, um, uh, of the systems and the infrastructure that it's in. That wouldn't be the case with, with most city systems. Most city systems would, within their code, be able to um, divulge through someone who is clever enough in the environment in which they operate and maybe other aspects about the network and the, uh, and the functionality of the broader um, technology suite of that agency. Back to the example I gave in my original opening statement, isn't, isn't a parent, for example, entitled to know why her child didn't get the first choice of their high school and someone else did? 
and why her child got her fifth choice? It would be difficult to take any umbrage to that. You know, I'm, I'm a parent myself, who've, and I've had, you know, children go through the, all four of my children go through the public education system here. We certainly don't argue with the rights of, of citizens to have transparency. We very much support that. But right now, there's no such thing. The parents are told, well, there was no seat. How do we know there was no seat? How did somebody else get the first choice and my child got the fifth choice? And, yeah. I mean, there was no seat for my child in her second choice or third choice? And there is no transparency whatsoever. So when we seek to find out about these algorithms and what goes into decision making, this is something that's clear and concise that people can relate to every day in the city of New York. But it's one of many, many instances that exist. And we understand that. But separate from my bill, I don't think that we're doing anything about this. I think you'd be right. No. So if you believe in transparency, where, where have we been? We don't believe in transparency when it comes to algorithms because we're not doing anything. Has this been discussed internally before my bill? Has, has anyone said to themselves, you know, we owe the public an explanation. One day somebody's going to come out. One day somebody's going to wake up. Um, it was a new topic to me, and I'm fairly up on the, uh, you know, the questions that are being asked. Do you know of any city agencies using algorithms to make automatic decisions that are not reviewed by a human before being administered? I don't know of any firsthand. Okay. Now, I know that HRA deploys algorithms to detect benefits fraud. And uh, in other states, there have been reports about eligible applicants being automatically denied benefits by a computer system with no level of human review. Mm. Are you aware of any such thing in the city? Um, I'm, I, I'm not uh, firsthand aware of the HRA system. You know, I've heard mention of it. Um, so I can't, I can't comment beyond that. You know, I think that um, the, uh, the, uh, the best way to approach a question like that would be able to, would be to take it up directly with the agency who has that system. Um, but no agency, no, no agency chose to attend today. Does the Human Resources Administration, does the um, Human Rights Commission have uh, people in, and Human Rights Commission studying algorithms? Are you aware of this? Human um, Rights Commission? I don't know that they're studying algorithms specifically. I know they're study studying decision making, or I've heard that they have. They're studying what? Decision making. Decision making. Yeah. My understanding is that they're studying decision making. I, I will agree with you. And I requested of the mayor's office that somebody be here from Human Rights Commission, and, and I never heard back for the record. You state that uh, now algorithms are used to supplement decision making. Is there a feature where they do make fast decisions? Well, there are certainly places in which if you had multiple inputs and you had a lot of data to process, then, then the, um, the algorithms, the computer programs themselves could enhance the decision making process. But, uh, and this is purely from, from the experience that we've had directly with agencies with systems thus far. I, I personally do not know of a, of a system that renders a unilateral decision without, without um, um, uh, human assistance. I, I think there are um, certainly algorithms that are uh, in action that render information on which decisions are predicated, or they can render maybe values or, or sorting of information. But I don't know of a fully automated decision rendering system. Um, and that's not to say it doesn't exist, I just haven't encountered one. Well, the first thing that comes to my mind again is that when a student is assigned to a high school, it is done strictly by computer. That is my understanding. Okay. That student's assigned by computer. Because I've had cases where students and their parents have come to my office, and when they've come to my office, we've been told, we cannot touch the assignment. They must go to a central office, and they can appeal as, as a hardship. Yeah, yeah. So we have computers using algorithms and data spitting out pupil assignments that no one can touch. How does somebody get an apartment in public housing? I'm told that it's strictly done by computer. And once again, I don't have first-hand knowledge of those specific yeah. systems. but They give you a computer assignment, and then you have the right to appeal once. And if you appeal once, you appeal once, but then after that, if you don't like what they gave you, you come off the public housing list. If we're going to be governed by machines and algorithms and data, well, they better be transparent. They're not transparent. 
How, how does someone know what public housing project they're being assigned to? Mm -hmm. On what basis? Many people want to live in public housing who want to be near their doctors. They want to be near their elderly parents. They have criteria too. They matter too. Yet they don't matter because some inhuman computer is spitting them out and telling them where to go, and if you don't like it, lump it. Well, I have a right to know what criteria is going into that machine. What is, what is the basis for this decision? And right now, no one can tell me how this is done. And you want to talk about homelessness in the city of New York? You want to talk about it? Now, um, feedback loops, I want to go into that. So, for example, if a policing algorithm decides where to station officers based on nuisance crimes, officers are likely to make more arrests for nuisance crimes in that area. And then more officers are stationed there, and so on. Is there any way that you, are, you have looked at this to examine whether this is a, a fair criteria in allocating police manpower, whether this results in, in many people, in many communities, having an increase in arrest for nuisance crimes? Yeah, we've not, yeah we, we weren't involved in that system at all. No. So nobody is watching any of the agencies as they implement algorithms. That's what I'm being told. Agencies right. are watching their own algorithms. That's correct. Yeah. Um, but I would have to caution Can again. Can you provide us a list with those agencies? I don't even have a list of what agencies use, alg use algorithms. Do you have a list of what agencies use algorithms? Well, I would say that probably every agency uses some algorithm. I mean, if you use a computer program, you're using an algorithm. Right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I would like a list, and I don't understand how no one knows what other agencies are doing. Don't, don't we have deputy mayors that oversee a portfolio of several other agencies? Deputy mayors oversee a portfolio of several agencies. Do the deputy mayors know what algorithms and data-driven Al algorithms are used to determine basic decisions? I haven't heard of a position that was given that responsibility. But. I think we're missing something. Very drastic. Now, you've cited some objections to the legislation, but I don't hear you saying that there's no need for legislation. No, I mean, we, we are strongly in favor of transparency around the, the decision-making process. So I think that we have to do something. And we, and we would love to work with you on, on finding a, a practicable and a, you know, executable solution. But it would have to involve working, obviously, with the agencies as well. Are you open to a, a, a commission-type legislative body um, a commission formed by legislative act that would call in stakeholders and try to arrive at legislation modeled after what I proposed, but maybe uh, modifying it as we see fit to get the, the um, desired result? It's a, that's an idea that we could come back to you on. Okay. Okay, I want to thank you both. Yep. Oh, we now have witnesses to testify. Now, okay, um, I have to vote, so let me just call up the first panel and, and we'll take a, a two-minute recess. Dr. Julia Powells, Rashida Richardson, New York City Liberties Union, Dr. Powells from Cornell Tech, Rachel Levinson Waldman, Brennan Center for Justice. I think three people's enough. No, but it's five, we don't have five chairs. Noah Hidalgo, Beta, New York City. Be right. That was so good, right? <laughs>
I was like trying to write down. <laughs> I didn't know we were gonna get four minutes, so I timed this for three minutes. Uh, I'm not sure it's four minutes. Yeah. Uh, Hi. Hi. I'm Julia. Hi, uh, Rachel. Nice to meet you. Have you done these before? So I think we did. Yeah. I almost gave away my copy. <laughs> Have you done this before? <laughs> Many times? You can be the pro. No. Because the thing is, it's like, I try to be the speed reader, but then it's like you get jumbled so, when and you... Can they, is there a possibility they cut us off? So y usually it's a time limit. So I like, so our testimony is like six pages, but I cut it down to... But, um, okay, let's please reconvene. I'm sorry. And this Had a vote. Okay, we, we, we will now reconvene. Noel, would you like to go first? Please identify yourself. And we're going to give each person three minutes. Um, three minutes. Uh, it's really hard to follow after what you just asked. So uh, three minutes is, uh, is, is an honor. Um, uh, I, I submitted some written testimony. I'm not going to sure that I'll be able to get through it all. Um, but first of all, we want to thank you for vocal. We want to thank you for this opportunity to vocalize our support for the bill. Uh, I speak as the executive director of Beta NYC and a former uh, technology and democracy fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School's Ash Center and a former fellow at at Data and Society's research institution. Um, and for the past five years, we've been able to collaborate with this administration and previous administration uh, to get the open data law passed. Um, and as we are a community of over 4,400 technologists, designers, data scientists, and civic hackers who want to see an equitable municipal government in the 21st century, this legislation reinforces the core of a future and equitable municipal government. In 2016, Data and Society's research institution produced a number of documents outlining um, what is at stake when we're dealing with algorithms, uh, and we must be concerned about technology companies as dominant curators of information and their unprecedented power to engineering the public sphere and social services. And to be perfectly blunt, our future of democracy is at stake. If we refuse to hold algorithms and their authors accountable, we no longer have government for the people by the people. If we refuse to hold algorithms and their authors accountable, we outsource our government to the unknown. At this past year's NYC School of Data, our annual conference, we hosted a panel on algorithmic discrim innovation, uh, where we discussed how parts of our criminal justice system is governed by black boxes. How can we talk about justice when we can't see the software code, the algorithms, or hold the underlying software accountable in the same way that we hold humans accountable? Our democracy requires transparency, copyright, nor trade secrets should ever stand in the way of an equitable and accountable municipal government. We're very fortunate that the city's existing open data law provides a framework for this bill, and in our written testimony, we've outlined a few core components that we would like to see added to this particular bill, and we look forward to a healthy and honest debate around the passage of the nation's first open algorithms law. Thank you. Thank you, thank you always. You've been great for this committee. Would you introduce yourself, please? Uh, hi, I'm Rashida Richardson for the New York Civil Liberties Union. Go. Okay. <laughs> um, I want to thank you for introducing the legislation and holding this hearing. The New York Civil Liberty Union respectfully submits the following testimony in support of intro 1696 legislation relating to the government use of algorithms. Federal, state, and local governments are increasingly using algorithms to conduct government services. One of the promises of algorithms is that they can process, analyze, and manipulate large amounts of data to help optimize government services. However, algorithms are fallible human creations that are vulnerable to many sources of error and bias. So there should be great concern when the government employs algorithms whose design and implementation are not understood by the government agents using them or the public. There is a strong public interest in ensuring that algorithms are designed and used in an equitable manner, especially when they affect decisions regarding the use of government force, allocation of public resources, or, poten or potential deprivation of civil liberties. In order to make this assessment, 
information about the design, use, functions of algorithms must be transparent. Without algorithmic transparency, governments stand to lose democratic accountability, efficacy, fairness in government processes, and control over sensitive public data. For the sake of brevity, I'm not going to read our entire testimony, but it does detail the many ways in which error and bias can exist in the creation and use of algorithms, so I encourage the council to read it in its full entirety. Um, but algorithmic systems function when best when stakeholders have access to enough information so that they can identify problems in design of the algorithm and its application. Therefore, a greater transparency about al the algorithms that government agencies use and how they're being used or implemented can help increase accuracy, fairness, and overall utility of these tools. As algorithm tools improve, they produce great, greater cost savings and help local governments become more sustainable. Algorithmic transparency can help increase public confidence in government practices and the systems um, by making constituents feel like they are actively engaged in government systems that affect their lives. Conversely, if algorithmic-based decisions of government remain opaque and invisible, New Yorkers will feel increasingly confused about the rationale for government policies, and this will lead to increasing skepticism about the fairness and, accountabil and accountability of government officials and the decisions they make. Therefore, we urge the City Council to pass pass intro 1696 as soon as possible because the civil liberties and civil rights of New Yorkers depend on it. Thank you. Introduce yourself, please. Certainly. Good afternoon, Chair Vaca. My name is Julia Powers, and I'm a research fellow at the Digital Life Initiative at Cornell Tech, uh, New York City's bold new interdisciplinary research and tech campus at Roosevelt Island. I'm joined in providing this testimony with two of my Cornell Tech colleagues, Professor Helen Nissenbaum, Professor of Information Science and Director of the Digital Life Initiative, and Thomas Ristenpart, Associate Professor of Computer Science. Um, we're together involved in a major multi-year NSF-funded research project um, to investigate threats to privacy and fairness in automated decision-making systems, and in particular to develop mechanisms to bring um, accountable information use in such systems. The most important work that a bill in the area of automated systems can do is to bring accountability, both the accountability of vendors to the, of these systems to the city and the accountability of the city and its agencies to the people of New York, as has been very clear in your line of questioning. This bill is an ambitious attempt to seek accountability through transparency, and we applaud you and um, your committee for bringing forward the proposal. It's an, a direction of legislation that, that is both exciting and essential. I'd like to just focus my comments on some aspects where the bill makes important advances but does not yet reach the critical ends that you outlined in your opening statement. A primary source of these limitations is that the provisions in this bill are placed in the administrative code in the section under open data. This fundament fundamentally affects the nature and impact of the bill as it is currently drafted. It means, crucially, that according to section 23504C of the code, the bill gives rise to no actionable rights, either for individuals or against an agency. Section 23504A makes clear that data is provided to the public only for informational purposes, with section 23504B clarifying that there are no guarantees as to completeness, accuracy, content or fitness for use. Further, the bill's placement within the open data provisions also means that following the logic of section 23501G, any proprietary claims and intellectual property assertions in relation to code and systems which are rife in this domain, no matter how broad or baseless, will readily thwart your intents of transparency. It may be that the city regards that locating these provisions in the open data provisions is optimal for other reasons. For example, the city's commitment to open public processes. But we urge that the legislative context should be given further and very careful consideration. If it is resolved that the present location is optimal for other reasons, the bill should be elaborated and the applicability or otherwise of the remainder of the provisions should be explicitly addressed, particularly those concerning private rights of action, liability of agencies and the tension between disclosure of the source code and the operation of automated systems and proprietary interests. One further dimension of the um, <laughs> um, I just wanted to also say about black box testing, it's a domain that particularly my colleague Professor Ristenpart works on. The requirement um, is likely to be very administratively, 
administratively burdensome on agencies as the um, mediators of this requirement. It often takes many thousands of queries, depending on the context, to be able to do the necessary third-party testing in the public interest of algorithmic systems. And we're concerned that such a prospect is likely to be highly constrained if they're always to be mediated by agencies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Rachel Levinson Waldman, and I am Senior Counsel to the Liberty and National Security Program at the Brennan Center for Justice. The Brennan Center is a nonpartisan law and policy institute that seeks to improve our systems of democracy and justice. And the Liberty and National Security Program specifically focuses on restoring the proper flow of information between the government and the people by, among other things, uh, increased public access to government information and securing appropriate government oversight and accountability. As part of that work, I filed a freedom of information law request last year with the New York City Police Department requesting information about their use of predictive policing technologies. As you know, predictive policing involves the use of statistics or algorithms to make inferences about crime, where a crime is going to occur or that a particular person might commit a crime. It has been the subject of considerable criticism from civil rights and civil liberties advocates, including ourselves. There have been significant concerns that predictive policing both relies on and recreates patterns of biased law enforcement, simply sending officers back to neighborhoods that are already over-policed. In addition, there is uh, little hard proof that predictive policing is actually effective in predicting and reducing crime. One phrase often uses that predictive policing predicts policing. It does not predict crime. In light of these concerns, transparency about the code that provides the foundation for predictive policing is paramount. According to publicly available documents that we reviewed in preparation for our FOIL request, the NYPD expected to spend about $45 million on predictive policing technologies over the course of five years. But there was little information publicly available about how the department intended to use the technologies, what information would be input, and how the community, how the community would be affected, among other questions. We were concerned that the use of predictive policing was occurring in the dark, with little information available to the most affected communities about how policing decisions were being made or opportunity for those com communities to make their concerns known. As a result of that, we filed a FOIL request last July for a range of documents. We got no records from the NYPD, either from our request or a subsequent appeal, and so we filed suit, where we emphasized the important interests and transparency that FOIL embodies, much as this legislation does as well. Almost immediately after we filed suit, the NYPD did disclose some documents about predictive policing, um, but they did not disclose the source code for their predictive policing algorithm, um, along with a range of other important information. It's worth noting that the NYPD has expressed concerns about making the source code for predictive policing publicly known. They've argued that with the source code in hand, criminals could learn where police officers will be patrolling and evade detection. We believe, as we have told the NYPD and the judge hearing the case, that this risk is remote. Predictive policing programs generally identify limited areas where officers are directed to spend some fraction of each shift. They do not direct or reveal the location of each officer at every moment, and we believe they are extremely unlikely to provide a detailed roadmap to the curious criminal. On the flip side, there are significant public benefits to understanding the workings of this program for transparency and community accountability. And as a result, we strongly support the passage of Bill 1696. Let me ask you, so you brought the lawsuit, they provided some information, but not all of what you wanted. Not, That's correct. Not, not, the more, not the most significant. Where is the lawsuit now? Um, we had a hearing in August, and the, it's, it's before the judge to render a decision. Before a judge? Yes. How long is this lawsuit going on to get the information that you wanted? How long, sorry, was it? Is the lawsuit going on for you to get this information? Um, so we filed our request last July. We then filed suit in December. We had a hearing before the judge, and soon after we filed suit, so probably in January, the NYPD produced initial information, which did call into some question the initial refusal to produce documents. Um, we then continued the suit because there was more information we believe that they basically owed to us and the public, and so there was the hearing in August. So the lawsuit has been going on now for about nine months. Before that, you had filed a um, Freedom of Information Law request, FOIL. Correct. Where did that go? In terms of whether it produced documents? Did you get anything? No. Nothing from the original request or the appeal. So then you went to court? Correct. The interesting question I have is how many people go through the FOIL process and never hear anything, and I just think sometimes people wish that they would go away. 
Well, and if, if I may add something, it was quite striking to us um, there were several different exemptions that were invoked in response both to our request and our appeal. Clearly those exemptions could not have actually applied in their entirety since then documents were produced in response to our a lawsuit. And in the hearing in August there was a comment from the police department's general counsel suggesting that to some extent that was the strategy to wait for a lawsuit to really be forced to produce documents and at that point start the process of disclosure. Thank you very much for your support for the legislation, and we will certainly be calling upon you, hopefully, as we develop it further. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Councilmember Greenfield has joined us, and we welcome him. Our next panel, Scott Levy, the Bronx Defenders, Young Me Lee, Brooklyn Defender Services, Alexander Krupp from the Bronx. New York. Have a seat. Are you Mr. Krupp? Yes, I am. Okay. I'd like you to go first. I know your building <laughs> where you live. Sure. Right outside my district. Used to be in my district. Yeah, I'm a couple hundred yards away in Council Member Torres' district. Yes, but you were in my district for eight years. You are building. Okay. Interesting. Okay, Mr. Krupp, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So I, I don't have like prepared testimony, but I want to say first to like thank you for this bill. Like I'm very strongly in favor of it. Uh, you know, just as a citizen, like it certainly does seem like that if the government wants to, for example, put me in prison, then like I should be able to see the software that determines how that sort of like decision is made. Uh, but beyond just being a citizen, I'm also an entrepreneur and a software developer. Uh, it, like and as such, like I'd like to note that you know, if, if you want to say paint someone's nails as like a cosmetologist, there's like a thousand hours of training that you need to go through in New York State. But if you want to create these sort of algorithms, there's no training at all, no college degree required, no professional certification, uh, and that you know problems uh, in this sort of software is really more the rule than the exception in my professional experience. Uh, you know, further, as like an entrepreneur of like a small startup, not Facebook or Google size, I'd like to say that although, you know, you seem to come at this uh, from the position of someone like being very skeptical of the technology, from my perspective, I think it would actually greatly benefit the New York technology industry uh, as one of the... Uh, uh, earlier speakers was saying, like, there are some issues with the bill I see. I think a lot of software that powers New York City would have to be rewritten since it was not originally written to be open source. Uh, but from my perspective, that's a good thing. Like, you know, this software written in New York City, like, of course it should be transparent uh, and not, you know, closed, closed source software created by a uh, you know, companies from across the country or outside the country. Uh, this bill, like, not only would New York's policy be in a position to, uh, you know, set the precedent for the country, but, like, this software created here to be compliant with this legislation can not only power New York City, but could power every other city across the country as well. Uh, so I think this would be very good for New York's technology industry. Uh, you know, and for New York entrepreneurs. Thank you very much. Yes? Uh, would you like to identify yourself, please? Thank you. Um, my name is Scott Levy. I'm special counsel for the criminal practice at the Bronx Defenders. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, I've submitted written testimony, uh, so I will try to sort of summarize what we've put in that, uh, in that testimony. We're really here today to bring to the committee's attention a specific algorithm that is currently in development through the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice in the use of pretrial detention. 
and we want to draw attention to that fact and also suggest some steps that this committee might take and that the City Council might take in ensuring that those algorithms are used correctly, are just, are fair, uh, and ultimately help uh, further the goals of a fairer and just, more just uh, criminal justice system. Um, in particular, the city is currently developing a new algorithm with uh, the criminal justice agency and an outside private contractor to predict uh, people's failure to risk of failure to appear uh, in court. Um, and this tool that's under development would be used by judges in thousands of cases across the city, tens of thousands of cases across the city every year in making bail determinations. That is, determining whether somebody from, a, whether a New Yorker returns to their family and community after they are arraigned in criminal court or whether they spend uh, days, months, or even years sitting on Rikers Island. Um, we think that the committee and the city council can play a crucial role in making sure that the algorithms that are in development uh, don't create more uh, harm, or don't do more harm than they do good. Um, and specifically, we want to alert the committee to our position that we believe that these types of algorithms have the uh, possibility of actually increasing pretrial detention in New York City. Uh, that is obviously problematic for a number of reasons, the first of which is that the city is uh, currently trying to close Rikers Island and decrease the pretrial detainee population at Rikers Island. Uh, it is our fear that the development of these types of algorithms um, may actually hinder that progress. Uh, there is nothing inherent in these algorithms that would lead to a substantive decrease in the use of pretrial detention. Um, and these algorithms present an enticing but ultimately false promise that we can accurately predict whether an individual will come back to court or not. The truth is we can't predict, um, but attempts to do so will likely lead to incre increases in pretrial detention. Um, we believe that the primary goal of bail reform in the city and across the state should be decreasing our jail populations, um, and that any uh, any algorithm that the city might develop should be judged on that metric first and foremost. Um, and transparency and uh, accountability are crucial components of any uh, holding the city to account, uh, to account for, these, for these algorithms. And specifically, we think that the council uh, can insist the city adopt a do no harm approach to these. Uh, to these uh, instruments. I will try to very quickly sum up the rest. We are also very concerned about the racial justice, uh, racial justice aspects of these algorithms. We know that these algorithms are only as good as the data that goes into them. And that data, as we know, is tainted by years of uh, disproportionate arrest rates and conviction rates in communities of color across the city. Um, and so we are worried that the creation of these algorithms will exacerbate existing racial disparities. Um, and we want to caution, and again, transparency and, uh, and oversight and accountability are the only ways that we can actually ensure that we don't make problems worse than they already are. Uh, and I will, I will just end by saying one of the things that we would recommend is that, not, that transparency and accountability are, are good first steps. But the city has recently required other agencies to do uh, equity assessments in, uh, in develop when they develop certain policies and programs. And we would suggest that before certain algorithms are put into use and actually applied against, uh, applied in courts, that the city be required to do equity assessments of these tools before they are actually put into use so that there is actually some ex ante uh, oversight of these algorithms so that they aren't just put out into the field uh, going forward. Thank you. Well, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Young Mee Lee. I'm a supervising attorney at Brooklyn Defender Services. BDS provides multidisciplinary and client-centered criminal, family, and immigration defense, as well as civil legal services, social work support, and advocacy for over 30,000 clients in Brooklyn every year. I want to thank the New York City Council Committee on Technology and in particular Chair James Vaca for holding this hearing today. Um, I want to talk about risk assessment instruments and predictive policing today. Um, across the United States uh, and especially in New York City, uh, nearly half a million people are detained pre-trial, legally presumed innocent but locked up. 
The majority of these individuals are legally eligible for release on bail, but detained because courts set bail in an, in an amount and form they can't afford. Financial conditions of release are on their face discriminatory and amplify broader inequalities in society. While attempts at reform have come in cycles for the last several decades, the most onerous forms of money bail remains in use in most of the country. Meanwhile, multinational surety companies have profited from this, ma from this mass misery through the financing of the bail bonds industry, which is banned in every country except the United States and the Philippines. Because the courts generally only accept bail in cash or commercial bail bond as opposed to, for example, an unsecured bond, which is authorized uh, by the New York State um, Penal Law and Criminal Procedure Law, bail bond agents are often a family's only hope for getting a loved one out of jail. These agents can charge exorbitant, unrefundable fees, demand unlimited collateral, and impose onerous conditions all with no meaningful oversight by local, state, or federal regulators. The industry siphons billions of dollars from marginalized communities across the country. Understandably, there is a demand for something, anything, different, but policymakers must be deliberate about reform. Specifically, the goal of bail reform must be to reduce pretrial detention and eliminate racial and other disparities. The, the zeitgeist in bail reform is the promotion of RAIs to drive decisions about pretrial detention, but it is not clear this approach will help rather than harm. RAIs purport to objectively and accurately predict one outcome or another. In reality, they function as a proxy for a series of subjective human decisions. In practice, RAIs typically, typically use a series of highly discriminatory metrics that provide little or no utility to seeing the future. Common factors include homelessness, employment status, school enrollment, age, family connections, prior convictions, and prior incarceration. RAI proprietors argue their tools are not discriminatory because they do not consider demographic information. But this analysis ignores the pre-existing sharp disparities in the aforementioned factors. A landmark ProPublica investigation of RAIs found one commonly used tool was more likely to falsely identify black people as likely to commit a crime. The investigation also found this RAI to be only somewhat more accurate than a coin flip in determining a risk of reoffense and remarkably unreliable in predicting violent crime. RAIs come with a unique threat to liberty in New York State a concurrent push to allow judges to make assumptions about dangerousness using RAIs in pretrial detention decisions. Under currently state law, judges may only consider, under current state law, judges may only consider a risk of flight with certain exceptions. While RAIs can be used exclusively to measure this risk, many high-level policymakers, including Mayor de Blasio, are urging changes to the bail statute so that dangerousness may be assessed and considered as well. As such, the first order of business is to stop this push toward dystopic preventive detention. There is ample evidence that even a few days in jail can be criminogenic. Preventive detention is a counterproductive tool of public safety. Moreover, there is no guarantee that adding dangerousness to the statute would significantly, significantly reduce jail populations. Please conclude. Sure. In short, RAIs, by their nature, bypass an individual's right to due process and the individualized case-by-case -case analyses required of prosecutors, judges, and defense attorneys. I, I just want to add that while many RAIs across, that are being used across the country um, claim to be uh, transparent, what's really not transparent and what's needed is the underlying data to come up uh, that formulates these algorithms that are used in risk assessment instruments. So I urge uh, the City Council to really include RAIs in this bill and to also require that the underlying data be uh, transparent as well. Thank you. Thank you all. Councilman Greenfield has a question. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the legislation that uh, you are sponsoring today and then the hearing that we're having. certainly. Fascinating uh, stuff. You know, I, uh, we had another hearing this morning, a different hearing on youth services, and I was actually able to quote uh, a line from another one of my uh, favorite uh, movies, My Cousin Vinny, 
Uh, so today's movie day for me. This is like Minority Report, right? We're sitting around and trying to figure out who's going to engage in uh, what crime. So I guess I guess the question uh, the question that I have um, is twofold. So the first is that you know I'm sure you heard their city's testimony, and in their testimony from the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, they said, well, there are considerable security concerns if they were to give you this give us rather right it would be the public give us publish these algorithms so you folks are the experts in security i'm a lawyer law professor legislator so talk to us is that in fact a legitimate concern or is the city overstating their case when they say that there are quote considerable security concerns anybody who feels like they're an expert can answer this question i mean i'm, I'm happy to address that i think with with respect to risk assessment tools and algorithms used in pretrial detention decisions, uh, there are no such security risks. This is essentially past data uh, that is put into an algorithm to produce risk scores uh, and, uh, and risk assessment instruments. The, the, the data can be anonymized and randomized and, and, and essentially cleaned so that there are no privacy concerns or security risks. And I, I was not able to talk about predictive policing, but uh, when we're talking about um, constitutional protections versus um, pr uh, possible security risks that aren't even realized and may never happen, um, I think our constitutional protections have to take precedence. Yeah, certainly there are potential security concerns def depending on how you define them. You know, for example, with the case of you know, students trying to figure out, like, why they got assigned to which school district. Like, you could certainly imagine a case where, you know, a parent could get their kid assigned to, like, a better school district just by, uh, you know, it's like spelling their first name district, you know, slightly differently or, or moving a couple, you know, doors over, you, you know, whatever the case is, like, once these algorithms are public. Uh, but I don't you know, see anything that should be like a showstopper or, uh, you know, ultimately prevent this type of legislation from getting passed. Got it. And then my, my second question, I just want to clarify at this point just to really understand this a little bit better. So uh, we're living in the sort of the post-Equifax uh, uh, data breach world, right? So I think the average citizen like me, you folks are professionals, you, you obviously uh, you know, you you uh, wear a sweatshirt, uh, so you clearly are a tech startup guy who's an expert, unlike the guy who's wearing the, the suit and tie. So certainly you're more qualified to understand this than I am, so I'm just curious to understand this uh, a little bit better from a tech perspective. The reality is that whether we like it or not, our data is being mined all the time, right? So there's all this data that's out there, and the credit card companies, for example, or not the credit card companies, but the, the credit data companies and the credit card companies and the mortgage companies and everything from getting your car to a credit card to, uh, in some cases, the job that you apply for, although happily no longer in New York City, there is data that people are accessing, right? So I'm trying to understand sort of from your perspective, where's the line as to, okay, this, it's okay to access this data versus it's not okay to access the data at all versus it's okay to access the data if we all know what data is being accessed, right? So I'm just trying to understand sort of like that because it seems to me like from listening to the uh, city's testimony, that's sort of part of their concern as well. So where do we go where we say, okay, don't ever access my data versus it's okay to access my data versus it's okay to access my data if we all know what the data is being accessed. So where do you fall out in that, and how do we navigate the realities of the fact that's just sort of the world we live in, right? You surf the web, and, and I know this happens to me on my iPhone within five minutes. You know, I'm looking for pants for my 10-year-old uh, son, and I get 60 different pop-ups from different pant companies uh, saying, you can get really cool belts and pants and shoes for your kids. Well, they must know somehow because, right? So where does that line cross in terms of how it interacts with government? I'm just genuinely trying to understand this from your perspective. Uh, sure. Well, I mean, from, from like the startup perspective, like certainly the Equifax uh, breaches are like quite alarming. Uh, you know, every time we have one of these is incidents where, you know, very large multinational companies like lose everyone's data, then it undermines the trust that everyone has in the technology industry. Uh, and this doesn't even necessarily hurt the companies 
that are very big, like you know Equifax or Google or Facebook, because they're too big to fail. Frankly, it's it's really the startups where you know like these big companies create this problem uh, of exposing data, and but like the the trust issue really impacts startups even more. I think in in terms of like. You know what should be allowed, like like. Certain- I guess that's my question. More specifically, what what is government going too far as far as accessing the data versus what do you think is okay versus not okay? It. Oh yeah. I think um, there's a difference between uh, when the government accesses data and what they're using that data for, and how it's used, as opposed to a private citizen giving up some private information for a specific purpose. Um, so I think in the case of RAIs, predictive policing, um, thousands of New Yorkers are not consenting to the use of their data, their information to be used for this purpose that can result in uh, racial policing, over-policing, uh, the invasion of privacy interests. All right. Thank you for that. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Our next panel. Taylene Sorosarian, Tech NYC, Josh Narkin and Julie Fry, the Legal Aid Society, Roderick Wallace, Julia Stoyanovich, Stoyanovich. Roderick, are you here? Okay, we'll start with Mr. Roderick Wallace. Would you identify yourself, please? Uh, my name is Roderick Wallace. I am a research scientist in the division of epi- It's okay, go ahead. <laughs> that was quick. In the division of epidemiology at the New York State Psychiatric Institute, some of my research involves using algorithms as model systems for mental disorders. And that's not a good thing. Uh, In the past, I have done work for the Uniform Firefighters Association Occupational Health, and that required going to look in detail at the RAND models that nobody can see. We went in under Freedom of Information some years ago, and we got not only the models, but we got data, damaged data. The models, firehouse sighting model, the response time model, are based on model calculated response time of the first responding unit. Now, response time is a good index for an ambulance where you take the sick person to the hospital. At a fire, you have to build the hospital around the patient. So response time is not a good measure. Model calculated response time is a worse measure. Damage measures, empirical damage measures have to be used to determine fire department policy. Now, why would they go to this? Why would they do this? They're not stupid, they know this. At the turn of the 20th century, fire companies were established in high fire incidence tenement areas, lots and lots of them close together, because in 1905 and 1910, they understood this dynamic, and they wanted to keep those tenements from burning down. If you use a response time model, you will automatically target high fire incidence tenement neighborhoods for fire company eliminations. Now, who in the 1970s was living in high fire incidents neighborhoods, the minority voting blocks? So a RAND model, and it's, it's really simple stuff. I mean, you wouldn't be allowed to use this on fish populations, models of this quality. But behind the screen, they use these models on human populations, and they targeted high fire incidents, high population density neighborhoods for the withdrawal of essential fire service. Those models are really dumb, and they haven't changed since the 1970s. 
And uh, we have books on this stuff. I'll, I'll leave you one of our books. This was done under uh, an investigator award in health policy research from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is no small thing. And it goes into more detail than the papers I've handed out, which are 2011. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you. You touched on the RAND formula, and uh, so did I. I have a New York Post article from 2010 where they talk about it, and I think it's relevant to read some of the remarks. Uh, in 2010, we were facing a budget shortfall. The city almost went bankrupt in 1975, as you know, and there was a RAND formula then also. Um, the, the mayor's initial budget plan called for closing 20 fire yes. companies by July 1st. Yes. With more closings likely to come if other savings were not realized. Yes. The fire units up for closing will, would be announced that week. One of those slated for closings, by the way, was a fire company in my own district, the latter company on City Island right. in the Bronx, which we fought and we kept open. Once again, the fire department is making cuts with computer models based on data of questionable validity, releasing incomplete and misleading statistics when it suits the department's purposes, and refusing to release raw data so that their claims can be verified by anyone outside the department. But FDNY spokesman Frank Gibbons says this time it will be different. The chiefs are looking at other factors as well. There's a whole host of criteria, and then it's the expertise of the chief officers who have to consider all the facts and all of the data. Gribben says that the department does not share the data behind the models, nor will it discuss the specifics of how the models work. The public doesn't understand, Gribben said. In terms of what the criteria are for closings, we're not going to convince anybody by discussing, you know, the facts. We're not going to convince anyone. It takes your breath away. It takes my breath away. Now, at the time when they were going to close City Island, that's in my district, and those of you who know City Island, we are an, they are an isolated community of 4,200 people. And I went up to City Hall at the time. I met with the deputy mayors and all. And I was told, Mr. Vacca, you are one of the last when it comes to fire department runs. That's why you're being closed. Your firehouse on City Island is the last based on the number of runs. So I said, what else went into your calculations? How about the fact that this is an island, that it's cut off from the mainland, that response has to be considered when you have off-island fire companies coming, that we have many, many wood frame structures. And I went into the whole, nothing else supposedly was, was considered except the fact that the number of runs was small. But here, when you have an official at the time from the fire department being quoted as saying, oh, the public wouldn't understand. The public okay. would understand. There's the a public has a right to know. There's a civil war in the fire department. A certain group wants to go to damage measures, empirical damage measures, as the principal tool for policy decisions. Now, certainly, insurance you wouldn't cancel your insurance on weekends because you're not traveling on weekends. I mean, if something happens on City Island, you're, you're done. Uh, Breezy Point burned down. The deployment, the number of fire companies, were about 50 fire companies down from what we were before the Bronx burned out. We were about a Five thousand, two to 5,000 firefighters down. We've had attacks. We have, we're going to have more attacks on the city. We have global climate change. We're going to have more hurricanes. These people are using models from the 1970s that failed. It's known that they failed. Those models provide a shield a legal shield against accusations of arbitrary and capricious. That's all those models do. Those models do not adequately manage fire service. Large areas of the city wouldn't have burned down in the 70s if they had. Certainly not if we had knowledge of what the criteria was. 
and that we could have oversight here at this body if the community boards could know what the criteria was and the general public and the advocacy community. But now we sit here today in 2017 and we still don't know what the models are. We still don't know what goes into oh. the data that makes these agencies Most make of the models decisions. are actually buried in the scientific literature. And the handout that I've given out is a 2011 summary of what we were able to pull out. They publish, the people in the fire department, they publish stuff in the deep scientific literature that you can winkle out and you can make a picture of their algorithms. And it's, it's really, I, I don't know how to say this, you wouldn't manage a fish population using the fire department algorithms. You wouldn't be allowed. The, I mean, the environment groups would close you down, but we have been managing fire service for humans using models that aren't fit for the management of animal populations. And this continues. Firehouse sighting model, the response time model, they've gone to dispatch algorithms on top of these two models. I mean, this is not what you need to confront global terrorism or global climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, identify yourself. My name is Talene Sanisarian. I am the policy director for Tech NYC. And I wanted to thank you for having us here today, Chair Vaca and members of the Technology Committee. Tech NYC is a nonprofit trade group with the mission of supporting the technology industry in New York through increased engagement between our more than 500 members, New York City government, and the community at large. Tech NYC believes that New York's unique business ecosystem as a global center for so many industries, such as finance, media, fashion, art, and real estate, serves to strengthen the technology businesses that call New York home, and in turn, technology further strengthens those incumbent industries and our communities. With that in mind, we are here today to express our concerns regarding Bill 1696 before you, which seeks to amend the administrative code in relation to automated processing of data for the purpose of targeting services, penalties, or policing to persons. At the outset, we want to be clear that we strongly believe in transparency and ensuring that algorithms including those that govern the provision of public services, treat residents fairly and without any inherent biases. This particular proposal, however, is unworkable from the perspective of many of our members who are engaged in the local tech community. Specifically, imposing disclosure requirements that will require the publishing of confidential and proprietary information on city websites could unintentionally provide an opportunity for bad actors to copy programs and systems. This would not only devalue the code itself, but could also open the door for those looking to compromise the security and safety of systems, potentially exposing underlying sensitive citizen data. Indeed, one need look no further than the recent breaches of data, including at Equifax, which affected as many as 145 million Americans, and at the Office of Personnel Management, OPM, in which sensitive personnel information was stolen from current and former government employees and contractors. These are examples of the kinds of dangers that both public and private actors currently face. And given the sensitivity of the underlying data, it is crucial that any relevant law or regulation treat security concerns seriously. We are worried that this bill in its current form does not do that. Further, as you know, algorithms are used to improve service and reliability in numerous city services, such as hospitals, emergency services, schools, and courts. As such, the lack of a clear understanding of the impact of these systems is concerning, on, on these systems is concerning. Also, manda mandating proprietary information, which many companies have built their businesses on, be shared on public websites could cause a chilling effect on local companies willing to do business with the city. Unfortunately, this proposal does not take these concerns into account, and therefore we urge caution before imposing such broad and sweeping mandates. Instead, we ask the committee to work with the private and public sectors to find a more workable solution that could increase transparency while allowing companies and contractors to protect confidential information, and in conclusion, Tech NYC believes that there could be better ways to address these concerns and, under, and the underlying 
uh, of the underlying concerns in the proposed bill and urges this committee to more closely examine potential ramifications of this legislation, we are happy to provide any assistance or input that the committee requests towards that effort. Thank you for your time today, and we look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you. Next. Uh, thank you. I, I just want to clarify, we have two representatives from Legal Aid here today. If we can give two uh, three-minute components, that would be great, if that's okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joshua Nork, and I'm a staff attorney with the Decarceration Project at the Legal Aid Society, and we want to thank you, Council uh, Member, for having us in and giving us the opportunity to testify on what the Legal Aid Society believes is one of the most important and concerning issues of our time, the rise of big data and the corresponding lack of transparency and accountability that's come with it. Today, we're pleased to submit testimony on behalf of the Legal Aid Society, and we will focus on the proliferation of algorithms throughout the criminal justice system and its impact on our clients in New York City. While shortcomings of algorithms used by tech companies in Wall Street have been front page news, there's been little public discussion of the dangers posed by algorithms now being used in virtually every aspect of the criminal justice system. While such algorithms may not fuel catastrophes like the 2008 financial crisis or the 2016 federal elections, their burden is being disproportionately shouldered by our clients and their communities. These algorithms erode concepts of individual, excuse me, individualized justice, stand in opposition to principles of equal protection, and challenge both due process and fundamental fairness. They may result in wrongful convictions. They undermine the presumption of innocence. Critically, they've largely and been unregulated and hidden from public scrutiny. Our written testimony discusses six separate topics where algorithms are currently being used in the criminal justice system. Bail, predictive policing, DNA that my colleague Julie Fry is going to testify about, family court, uh, juvenile representation in delinquency proceedings, as well as parole proceedings and sex offender registration. I would like to specifically focus on bail. And I will reiterate, uh, or at least endorse, the comments of my colleagues from the Bronx Defenders and Brooklyn Defender Services who testified earlier. There are currently two algorithms being used in New York City right now uh, for bail determinations. Uh, the first has been used since 2001 and is used to predict failure to appear. To our new knowledge, this tool has never been independently studied or verified, and anonymized data and source code has never been released to independent third parties. It's currently administered by the CJA through an interview that occurs before every arraignment in every single case in New York City. The tools give judges one of three recommendations about someone's likelihood of returning to court. And the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and the CJA have openly admitted that this tool is out of date and ineffective. For the past few years, MOCJ has worked with CJA to redevelop the tool. But late last year, the redevelopment process was terminated. In September, Mock J and CGA conducted a forum at NYU School of Law that Legal Aid attended, and it was discussed the development of a new risk assessment tool that Scott Levy of Bronx Defenders mentioned would be uh, unveiled in late 2018 and 2019. The City Council, uh, we agree, should seek to step in and regulate these tools before they are developed. I will also point out, if I can just have one more second, that. In April 2016, the mayor announced a $17.8 million supervised release program that is currently being utilized in New York City. It has a limited space of, 3, 000, of, a limited space of 3,000 spaces. The city has developed and is currently using a risk assessment algorithm to determine eligibility for that program. To our knowledge, that data has not been released for independent peer-reviewed research, and we are seeking to get that data currently from MOCJ and CJA so that we can do that ourselves. And with that, uh, I will turn uh, the DNA portion over to uh, my colleague. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Julie Fry. I'm an attorney with the DNA unit of the Legal Aid Society. Year after year, we learn that innocent people have spent decades in jail based on faulty hair comparisons, bite mark analysis, and arson investigations, what history has shown to be junk science. Courtrooms have proven ill-equipped to stand guard against bad forensic sciences, and there is little public or scientific oversight that regulates their use. This bill provides much needed accountability in the absence of more robust regulation from courts or the scientific community itself. Its adoption will act as a barrier to wrongful convictions and will help ensure the fair and impartial administration of justice in New York City. The DNA unit of the Legal Aid Society has noted with concern the increased use of closed source proprietary software based on complex algorithms in DNA interpretation. 
The Legal Aid Society established a DNA unit in 2013 in an effort to train lawyers in the use of DNA evidence and to challenge the use of experimental and potentially scientifically unsound DNA interpretation techniques in the courtroom. Attorneys in the DNA unit won the only Fry hearing in the country to preclude the use of an algorithm-based DNA interpretation software, the New York City's own Office of the Chief Medical Examiner's uh, Forensic Statistical Tool, or FST. FST is a probabilistic genotyping program. It's designed to interpret complex DNA mixtures that would otherwise be uninterpretable. In practice, an OCME analyst would put into a report or testify as to FST results supporting the inclusion of a suspect in a DNA mixture. However, however the analyst issuing the reports or testifying on the witness stand had no idea how FST calculations were actually performed. There was no way to verify the soundness of FST's conclusions. The defense bar repeatedly sought the FST source code in order to consult with an expert regarding how the FST performs its mysterious calculations. In state court, we lost every time to the city prosecutors and OCME who vociferously opposed our efforts to obtain this code. The finer details on how FST operated remained in the dark. Last year, Judge Valerie Caproni ordered the OCME to turn over their source code to the Federal Defenders of New York. The Federal Defenders were the first organization in over five years to get its hands on FST's instructions. They hired an expert to review the code. The expert found that FST was performing calculations differently than the OCME, OCME described in court, differently from what OCME described to the New York State Commission on Forensic Science, and differently from what the OC, OCME described in their two scientific journals. And I should say that this difference was a difference that favored the prosecution. However, the expert was prevented by a court order from revealing the specifics because uh, the, the specifics of what he saw in the code. Uh, at this point, FSC has been used in thousands of cases. People pled guilty based on FSC results. People lost at trial based on FSC results. People went to prison because of FSC. We renewed our, we renewed our fight in state courts to obtain the source code to FSC. We needed to know how bad the problem was. OCME and, the, OCME and the New York City prosecutors continued to fight against us in court. However, OCME employees admitted that there was an error in the FST code, albeit a different one than what the expert in the Capone case described, and that FST has been changed. We recent, recently filed a complaint with the Inspector General's office, and due to the, uh, the press attention this received, we we're hopeful that the entire code will be released by the OCME soon. Um, however, the OCME has uh, started phasing out FST and instead replaced it with another proprietary software called StarMix. Unfortunately, StarMix is also closed source and has itself had two verified coding errors that resulted in miscalculations. The problem with closed source is not limited to searching for error errors, it also has to do with subjectivity. Different DNA mixture interpretation software programs are getting different answers in the same case. Um, as one of the StarMix designers stated, these programs, quote, contain elements of subjectivity programmed into them. Going to have to conclude. Sure. Because the clock has broken or stopped. Oh, <laughs> if somebody sorry, can fix I didn't it, hear the beep, so. I'm glad, I'm glad it helped you, though. It's okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, in conclusion, uh, the, the only way for this, to, this city to ensure that questionable forensic science stays out of our courts is to require all city agencies to use open source forensic software. This should be a procurement requirement. Science must be open to scrutiny. If not, the city will be welcoming more wrongful convictions within the five boroughs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Oh, I'm sorry, one more. Please come up. Let them go, because you have this way you have a, the desk. And um, why don't we call up the next um, panel? If the four of you can leave, and then we'll okay. keep you. All right. Okay, so I'll be the first on the next panel. Oh, are you with the legal aid? No, no, no. Oh, okay. This panel had five people, so should I be the first person on the next one? Yeah, you should be the first person. Okay. No, stay there. Yeah. You can take a, take a seat, and then um, I'll call up William. Yes, I will. William Bunfield. Charlie Moffitt. And we have one more panel after that. You go first. Good. Because I've waited patiently. Right. Okay. Um, my name is Julia Stojanovic, uh, and I'm ecstatic to be here, simply. I'm a resident of New York. I hold a PhD in computer science from Columbia. And I'm an assistant professor of computer science at Drexel University in Philadelphia, and also an affiliated faculty at the Center for Information Technology Policy at Princeton. 
Uh, in my teaching and research, which is generously funded by the National Science Foundation, I focus on data management and data science topics, including algorithmic ethics, fairness, accountability, and transparency. And I'm also the founder of the Data Responsibly Consortium. Um, I would like to express my enthusiastic support for the bill. Uh, however, it is my belief that the current bill, that the bill currently under discussion, requires significant improvement to achieve its intended goal. In my statement, I will focus on three critical shortcomings of the bill, namely that algorithmic transparency cannot be achieved without data transparency, that results received by the user by interacting with the system must be made interpretable, and thirdly, that enacting transparency will require significant technological effort on the part of the agencies, for which more time will be necessary than the 120 days that are currently provisioned. Uh, my first point essentially means that while making source code publicly available is a significant step towards transparency, as long as the posted code is readable, well-documented, and complete, very importantly, meaningful transparency of algorithmic processes simply cannot be achieved without transparency of data. In the case of predictive analyti analytics, like those used in predictive policing, data is used to customize algorithm behavior, and this is called training. The same algorithm may exhibit radically different behavior, make different predictions, different mistakes, and different kinds of mistakes when trained on two different data sets. And so without access to training data, we cannot know how a predictive analytics method will actually work. How will it, will it behave? But this issue is not limited to predictive analytics. Other decision-making algorithms, such as, for example, scoring methods, like the VI SPDAD, which is used to prioritize homeless individuals for receiving services, and the matchmaking methods, such as those used by the Department of Education to assign children to spots in public schools, do not explicitly attempt to predict future behavior based on past behavior, but they also rely on data in very important ways. These algorithms are designed and validated using data. So I would like to propose the following interpretation of transparency. In addition to releasing training and validation data sets whenever possible, agencies shall make publicly available information about the data collection and pre-processing methodology in terms of assumptions, inclusion criteria, known sources of bias, and data quality. Agencies shall make publicly available summaries of statistical properties of the data sets while using state-of-the-art methods to preserve the privacy of individuals. And when appropriate, we can also release uh, privacy-preserving synthetic data when we cannot release data publicly. Uh, and I will conclude here, but my written testimony contains more, specifically about interpretability for the user, for the auditor, and also I give some examples of similar legislation in Europe where much more than 120 days was provisioned. Thank you. I'm reading your testimony. It's very informative, so thank you for your, ins for your insight in coming here today. Sir, would you identify yourself, please? Hello, Council. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Charlie Moffitt. Um, I am currently a graduate student at NYU Center for Urban Science and Progress. Um, this past summer, I conducted some research on behalf of the Accountability and Algorithms Committee in the Civic Analytics Network, which is a network of chief data officers and uh, technologists in government across the country. Uh, this was done specifically um, in my hometown of San Francisco, but it gets shared across the country with different uh, technologists in government. And uh, New York City participates in this committee by way of MODA also. Um, so th most of the research um, that I had done would be an echo of some of the things had, that have already been said here today, but I just wanted to... Uh, contribute a couple um, extra points and some of the re recommendations that I made to, uh, to that committee. Uh, the first um, being uh, with regard to publishing source code. Um, even if alg an algorithm's code is known, um, oftentimes it'll be too complex for most folks to understand. So um, it, 
what we might consider a truly interpretable algorithm uh, would be something that would allow us to understand uh, the outcomes of that algorithm, not just uh, merely the process by which those outcomes were produced. Um, a, a key component of this uh, for, for any agency that wishes to use uh, automatic or uh, automated decision making uh, or algorithms would be to make clear uh, their confidence in their data. So, um, you know, we, we know the age old adage about garbage in, go, uh, garbage out, um, but being clear about the, the, the confidence in that uh, data quality that was used to train the, the algorithms would be essential. Um, a number of, of useful methodological recommendations uh, have already been set forth by the research community. Um, in terms of uh, addressing explainability. Um, and I'd also add that we should question the use of an algorithm at all um, if it can't be explained or, or meaningfully explained to, to the general public. Um, in terms of self-testing, um, it's critical to, to design terms of service that welcome audits um, of the algorithms, um, as your legislation has, has noted. Um, I would argue that the burden should fall, however, on the, on the vendor or agency that created the algorithms. Uh, too often we, we uh, rely on this reactive um, auditing, um, but really the, the people in the best position to explain the systems are the ones that, that created them. Um, but any audits that come about should, uh, should be documented and made available um, regarding the methods and uh, results of those efforts. Uh, efforts. Um, the, uh, the, the last kind of, I'll conclude with this. Um, what was communicated to me by different uh, professors of law and, and um, thought leaders in the field was the, the biggest source of power that government holds in this arena um, is, is um, leveraging their position when contracting with vendors and making sure that the, the terms of those contracts aren't restrictive in terms of how information about the algorithms um, can be released in the future. Um, secondly, the, to um, you know, I think there needs to be a set of uh, there needs to be a plan in place for what happens when the algorithms go wrong, or, or you know, if if, uh, if mistakes are made, specifically what the uh, what the course of redress would be for any individuals or groups. Um, last point here is that um, users should be made aware uh, when and why algorithms are being employed. Uh, as well as the degree to which human agency is being exercised uh, in such situations. Um, I have a lengthy 10, 12 page research document uh, that kind of goes into more of this in depth and would be happy to share uh, any of that upon request. Thank you for the opportunity. I thank you. I think you raised some good points. Um, contractors use algorithms, so legislation would probably have to include contractors and what transparency obligations contractors have toward their use of algorithms and data. The other thing you mentioned was about making sure that the data is understood, the algorithms are understood. Originally when DOE put things on their website, so I'm making faces at me, when DOE put things on their website, many parents did not understand what they were talking about. So we wanted transparency and we got it but it was not in an understandable format. So that's another challenge. Sometimes bureaucracies don't necessarily want information to be easily understood, but we certainly want to be inclusive of, of everyone when it comes to them knowing the, uh, the facts. So you raised two good issues. Yeah, the, I've heard lines drawn to media literacy, people starting to talk about algorithmic literacy or data literacy. So, um, you know, as you mentioned, it's not just enough to make everything available. Um, if it can't be understood by the people it's impacting, what use does it have? So um, different suggestions have been made about intermediary bodies or, or perhaps uh, people interested in um, the, the interests of the public maybe having some sort of funnel to explain what is made transparent to those end users. I just, I just think it's a question of simplif simplification that as we proceed, people in government have to be aware, we would expect. Um, being clear and concise, but also being um, 
making sure the information is formatted in as simple a way as possible and clear. Yes. Yeah, so uh, one important part of this is giving uh, the stakeholders, the users, the auditors, the developers of the algorithms, sufficient data context in the way that these explanations are provided, yes. right? So when you return a score to an individual, like 42, but the system actually ranks them, what is the individual to conclude about whether they are, their score is high enough to be at the top 10 or not high enough? What can they do to change things, right? And explaining things in a way that is interpretable and actionable requires that you release data in a way that is very thoughtful, that does not violate the privacy and the trust of individuals whose data is included in the data set. So these are very difficult and exciting technical questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Would you identify yourself, please? Hey, yeah. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having this hearing and for letting me speak. My name is uh, William Banfield. Uh, I'm a tech worker here in New York City. I work for one of the largest open source companies in the city. Um, but I have to stress that I am not here on behalf of that company. I'm here to discuss this issue as a private citizen. Uh, and I'd just like to talk about <clears throat> the value in op of open source. Um, <laughs> in terms of a parable relating to that company. Uh, in 2013, that company released a version of its product with a, an incorrect implementation of the Raft consensus protocol. Um, what that meant was that potential data could be lost. However, that company was an open source product, publicly available and viewable on GitHub. Anybody could uh, download it and compile it. Uh, and in 2013, uh, a member of the open source community downloaded it, compiled it, and ran his own set of tests against it and wrote a lengthy blog post about the set of issues with this piece of software. Uh, the open source community spent the next several years uh, <laughs> lambasting uh, them. And eventually, that private contractor was hired. And the fixes suggested by him by, were implemented in newer versions of the software. And the tests were ran uh, publicly and visibly currently to this day. Uh, and for that reason, uh, an implementation error caused by a private company could have resulted in tons of data loss, but because of the power of open source and visibility, it did not. Um, and so I think that largely speaks to the power of um, algorithmic visibility by the public. And then secondly, I would like to address the point of security. Uh, again, as a technologist, I feel fairly stable making the assertion that security through obscurity is not a comfortable way to, or a uh, practical way to enforce security. Many of the uh, most powerful algorithms for security that we use every single day are, again, visible public or, um, projects. Uh, first and foremost, OpenSSL um, is a public project visible, uh, again, on GitHub. Um, and it is the standard implementation of TLS. And it has a government certification for its implementation of TLS. So I find it very silly to say that keeping things a secret improves security. Uh, and those are my main statements. Thank you very much. Our, next, our last panel, Sumana Hara, 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 Oshawa, <laughs> Bert Motaldi, Motaldi. Alexander Rich. That was easy. Would, would you want to go first? Yes. Hi, Council Member. Me again. Yes. Hi. Sumana Hariharishwara, who spoke with you about open data last month. We're at the last hearing. I was. You were great. Why, thank you. I thank hope you. to impress again. Thank you. Yes. Uh, you'll have to hold up signs like 10 and so on. Um, so I'm speaking as a consultant, programmer, and citizen who uh, wants to tell you a few things in response to what others have said earlier today. One, Tech NYC does not speak for me. I am an entrepreneur and a programmer in New York City who's been in this community for more than a decade, and I'm an entrepreneur who works on open source tools that help governments make decisions. Open source and transparency are a way to better security. If there are businesses in our community that are making money off of citizen data and can't show us the recipe for the decisions they're making, they need to step up and they need to get better and we need to hold them accountable. I also want to bring up that uh, 
the phrasings, algorithms, analytics, and words like that probably need a little bit more attention in the definition of the law. Speaking of definitions, as I'm sure you've noticed, the placement of this particular bill in 23.502 means that, as uh, Julia Howe spoke earlier, uh, that means that there's no private right of action. That means that there's this cutout for private uh, things that are private secrets, trade secrets, proprietary code. Um, we need to fix the procurement process to make sure that we aren't taking in as many ven uh, vendors, right? We need to talk to these vendors, use the leverage we have to say, you should be using open source, you should be, code that you write using taxpayer money should be belong to the public, the same as a public park should be available to the public. But beyond that, also in this bill, we should iterate towards making it so that this, uh, this particular great goal of algorithmic transparency isn't limited just to a uh, code that no vendor can wave the flag of trade secret or patent on. Um, and I'll speak a little bit about don't let them try to tell you, oh, well, here's an algorithm. Here's a formula. I'll give you a piece of math that's written on paper but I won't show you the source code because I've decided to claim that's a patent or a trade secret. Don't let them fool you like that because then you don't actually know the recipe. You don't know what's in the dish that's being served. So auditability, it's good enough for the restaurants of New York City. It should be good enough for our code. Thank you. Hi, Councilman. Uh, thanks for having this hearing. Um, I'm, my name is Brut Muthalali. I'm a software engineer here at Google in New York. I'm speaking as a private citizen, not on behalf of my employer. Um, I wanted to directly address some of the concerns um, laid out by the Mayor's Enterprise Applications Office, um, Enterprise Architecture Office, sorry. Um, so uh, all of the objections raised so far have been about existing programs, programs that already serve the public and have been doing so for some time. Um, there is um, none of his concerns about um, the existing uh, security models of those programs or um, the onerousness of rewriting them to be freestanding programs, as he said, um, so that they're suitable for open source, apply to new development. So new development undertaken by the city can be held to this high standard of transparency by default. Um, I think at the very least, uh, if, if there's a pushback from uh, existing agencies, we could enforce this at, like, at the procurement level and at the agency level. Uh, secondly, I work in one of the biggest shared code bases in the world, if not the biggest. Um, the latest public numbers are that Google has like two billion lines of source code and we all work on it together. Um, uh, I wanted to say that uh, the uh, concerns laid out about uh, centralized review um, and, no, and the lack of centralization of um, security and privacy review and uh, the lack of centralization of the existing uh, review of equitability. Um, uh, Google does centralized privacy and security review. It scales to the largest, um, one of the largest code bases in the world. And uh, the people of New York should be able to obtain a list of all computer programs, um, whether open source or not, that police persons target services and impose penalties. Um, I feel like adding these two goals, uh, the procurement goal and the goal of being able to um, list programs that are currently being kept from the public that are being used to make decisions should be added to the text of the bill. Uh, thanks. Hi, um, my name is uh, Alex Rich. I'm a, a cognitive scientist and data scientist at New York University. Um, I want to thank you for uh, holding this hearing and, and suggesting this bill. Um, I just want to speak very briefly uh, on the topic of bail decisions that's already come up several times. Um, sort of talking about sort of two different directions uh, that, that that kind of algorithm uh, can go in. Um, so people have talked a lot about uh, these for-profit companies um, that are uh, creating systems that are used in a very opaque way, uh, and there's a lot of accusations uh, of bias uh, in those systems. Um, but there's also uh, recent um, academic work that I think is uh, worth your attention um, from people at uh, John Jay College and, and Stanford, as well as other uh, places, um, suggesting that these algorithms could instead be made in ways that are not just uh, open source, but in fact are quite simple and quite understandable by, um, by an everyday person. Um, so they've, uh, you know, made these systems that are just uh, basically a set of simple rules uh, that perform uh, basically indistinguishably from these very complex algorithms uh, and seem like they can um, lead more people to be released on their own recognizance than uh, current systems. Um, and so, you know, a system like this uh, would allow people to uh, uh, feel like they actually have 
if not control over their own lives, at least um, understanding of, of how these huge momentous decisions are being made for them. Um, so I think this kind of transparency and open source bill will be a, a really important first step towards uh, encouraging that kind of algorithm in society, one that you know, people can understand and people can um, you know, feel like it's working for them instead of opaquely against them. Thank you. I thank you very much. So much was brought up today. You know, I'm just sitting here thinking to myself and I'm saying, if you are, um, if you're convicted of a crime, you know that you have the right to appeal, but you know what you were convicted of and why and how. But if you're assigned high school X and you want to appeal, you do not know why you, you were not assigned high school Y. You were just assigned to high school. So on what basis were you denied what you wanted? Your appeal has to be based on your pleading that you want to be near home or you want to go to a special program, but you don't know how you were denied the first high school. Um, you don't know specifically why you were denied food stamps, so why you were placed in a certain public housing development. And, and uh, you could go down the list. What determines what fire companies were proposed for closing over the years? when we had firehouse clo closures. It's an elusive RAND formula that no one talks about as to specifically what is the formula. So, so much of what we're trying to arrive at today is, and I hate to use the word over and over again, but it is a transparency, but that is because people are entitled to know the facts. And they're, not, they're entitled to know how government decisions are made and on what basis. I would, say, I would say who makes government decisions, but I think we're, we're sometimes talking about what, because they're being made by data, they're being made by computers that receive data that create algorithms, and that's a little much. To the point of sort of understandability there, um, I, I alluded to the sort of report cards, the food report cards, right, that are, we're using New York City restaurants, right? We're not saying every single person in New York has to go and look around at the kitchens. We provide, we, we worked on it, and we figured out how to provide an easily understandable thumbnail that people can look at. And then, yes, if they want to understand, hey, look at more details about this permit and what, what assessment it got and what the rules are, they can go do that. We know how to do that work when it comes to medicine, when it comes to health, when it comes to the report cards for schools, although I, I know that's its own controversy, we can figure out how to do this. And we will be a world, le world leader if we do. Oh, yes, definitely. This is, this is a, a discussion that places New York City in the lead, again, because no other municipality or state has had this discussion. Uh, the legislation is meant to create that discussion, and we're looking for a, a product at the end of the day. So, as we find in the open source software community, and as I think uh, Mayor Bloomberg found when he was introducing 311, introducing the need of transparency and the goal of greater transparency ends up exposing all sorts of problems, inefficiencies, biases, such that along the way of implementing this work, you'll have done a, a great deal of work uh, right here in City Hall as a side effect. Without further to do, it is now 3.20 and with no further questions or, or um, people who wish to testify, this hearing is hereby adjourned. Thank you all for coming.